In the last video, we saw how the quantum teleportation protocol works. In this video, we're going to deepen our understanding by discussing a few of the more striking features of that uh, protocol. First, let me remind you how the protocol works. Basically, what we have is uh, two parties, Alice, and potentially a long, long way away from her, Bob. And Alice has in her possession a quantum state, which we'll denote by Psi. She also has, so that's a single qubit uh, state, she also has in her possession uh, one half of an entangled uh, bell state, the other half of which is held uh, by Bob. So this is a two qubit state uh, of which Bob has one part and Alice has uh, the other part. And this has been prepared, it doesn't really matter what uh, uh, procedure has been used. And what Alice does to teleport her state over to Bob is she uh, does a uh, bell basis measurement. And that gives one of four measurement outcomes corresponding to the four bell basis um, uh, 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 elements. And so she transfers her measurement outcome over uh, to Bob, who, so what this is, this is classical uh, information uh, that is uh, being sent, and she transfers it over to Bob, who does a recovery uh, operation, uh, which depends on what the measurement result is. And at the end of the day, the state that Bob has is just the original state, psi. So that's the quantum teleportation protocol. There are a few interesting aspects of the protocol. Uh, the first one is, you'll notice that Alice didn't need to know anything at all about the state psi. The protocol works independent of her knowledge of psi. And that's a pretty interesting fact uh, for a few reasons. One is um, that you know, to specify psi, we have to specify uh, two complex uh, numbers, the amplitudes for psi. And if you wanted to do that classically, the amount of classical information you'd need to specify would in fact be infinite. You'd need to specify you know, all the binary uh, expansion uh, in the real and imaginary components of those amplitudes. That's a lot of information. And yet somehow they've been able to transfer it using just uh, these measurement results. So it's a four outcome measurement. So using two uh, bits, uh, we can transfer uh, uh, the state uh, psi uh, over to Bob. And of course, we also needed uh, this pre-shared resource, the Bell state. But that was fixed and independent of Psi, and in fact could have uh, you know, been prepared uh, long before Alice came into possession of the state Psi. So somehow, you know, this is really quite a strange uh, fact. Um, another interesting fact uh, is, of course, you know, if indeed Psi is unknown to Alice, um, then there's no measurement Alice could possibly do to figure out what Psi actually is, as we noted earlier. Um, you know, it's, it's inaccessible information or hidden information. And yet, you know, somehow by doing this bell basis measurement and, uh, you know, all the other steps in the, in the protocol, uh, we're nonetheless able to transfer Psi over to Bob. So that's kind of interesting and, uh, uh striking. Um, a few other bits and pieces. Um, you might recall that the probabilities for each of the four bell basis uh, measurement outcomes were one quarter. And that was true independent of uh, what the state psi uh, was. So what that's telling you is that from the bell basis measurement, you actually can't infer anything at all about uh, the state uh, of psi. It doesn't mean anything. So in some sense, whatever this measurement outcome is revealing, it's not information about psi. It's information about something else. In fact, it's information, as we saw, about which recovery operation is required to recover uh, psi. So, you know, this is quite a, a curious and striking protocol, despite, you know, its extraordinary simplicity. It's, it's really just, you know, bell state preparation, bell basis measurement, and then some fiddling around to recover. Um, it has a, a lot of interesting and surprising um, properties. A couple of final points. Um, one misapprehension about this protocol is that somehow you know, it gives you the ability to have faster than light communication uh, from Alice uh, to Bob. But that's not true at all. And the reason it's not true is because to recover uh, the state psi, to apply the recovery operation, 
Bob, of course, needs to know what the measurement outcome is. He needs to know what the bell basis result uh, was. Um, and uh, yeah, that requires sending some classical information from Alice to Bob, and that is limited by the speed of light. And so at the end of the day, you know, uh, it's not possible for Alice to transmit psi over to Bob any faster than the speed of light goes. In fact, you can actually do, if you do a more detailed analysis, which we won't do, uh, it's a little bit tedious, but if you do do a, a bit more detailed analysis, you can prove that it's not possible uh, for Bob um, to get any useful information about Alice's uh, state before the measurement outcome uh, 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 actually arrives. So at this stage of the protocol, there's nothing he can do that gets any useful information uh, about Alice. And that's actually possible to prove um, you know, uh, really rigorously, uh, but we won't do it. Okay, uh, one last thing that I wanted to mention is that you might sort of wonder, well, you know, is this protocol, is it somehow creating a copy of the state psi? And actually, no, it's not creating a copy of the state psi. When we do the bell basis measurement here, it's a partial measurement. And so the uh, final state of these two qubits is one of the four bell states. In other words, you're destroying the state psi uh, as you do this bell basis measurement. Uh, but fortunately, um, it's possible to recover it uh, over here. So in some sense, you're, you really are moving or teleporting uh, the state psi from Alice over to Bob, and you're not retaining a copy uh, of the original. Okay, well, that's quantum teleportation. Um, you know, in, in some ways at this point, it looks just like a neat trick um, and not really like anything uh, deeper. I mean, a, an amazing trick and really quite uh, surprising. Uh, in fact, it turns out uh, that quantum teleportation um, it turns out to be sort of a basic primitive operation that can be used to do all sorts of other things. It's important uh, in ideas like quantum error correction. It's important in some uh, uh, quantum uh, computation uh, architectures. Um, so you know, it's really something uh, to put away into your toolkit uh, and save uh, for the future. Uh, it's been done by many different groups uh, all over the world in the laboratory. In fact, uh, uh, I participated in one of those experiments. Uh, but while it might have been done uh, in the lab, uh, it was done for very, very simple systems, you know, systems containing a single qubit or other very elementary type of quantum information. And, uh, you know, it's not a practical means of transporting large scale objects, certainly not people or even, you know, a, a, at a much smaller scale, you know, viruses or whatnot. I mean, it's just that that's utterly ridiculous. It's, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's not going to happen um, uh, anytime in the foreseeable future. You, if if you want to get from point A to point B, uh, take a bus is still the the best advice. Okay, so that's quantum teleportation. What we're going to do in the next video is we're going to uh, jump to a new topic, uh, and that is we're going to actually take a look at quantum mechanics as a general theory um, and understand exactly what the postulates of quantum mechanics say. We've sort of implicitly introduced all of those postulates uh, up to this point in discussing quantum computing and quantum teleportation and superdense coding, but now we're going to lay them down explicitly and take a look at the actual formal structure of quantum mechanics.